All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's get started with the Southeast Asia panel. Please make your way to your seats. Um, the panel will be hosted by Mitch. Mitch will take it over from here. Hi, guys. Uh, thank you, everybody, for showing up. Um, considering that the, this is being hosted in Macau, everyone thought it would be appropriate to do a panel on I Southeast at, Asia. I need at least one person. So um, like it's going to be about trends so in Southeast Asia. And I would like everyone to uh, take one minute to introduce themselves to the audience. Start with you, Jim. I'm Jim Manzak. I'm with uh, Valbury. Valbury is a uh, uh, organization based in uh, Jakarta, Indonesia, and we also have the London uh, FSA regulated entity. So I'm here to be able to speak uh, from on behalf of the Indonesian market as well as from, from the retail perspective and, and talk about the uh, institutional liquidity, if you want, around Southeast Asia and, and the rest of Asia. You seriously don't know who he is? Hi, my name is Mario. I'm from a company stay. called FX Primus. We, don't need uh, we are based uh, all around the world, but uh, our focus is mainly huh? in Asia. One of our expertise is really in world-class education. I, I front the education yeah, for FX Primus all around the world. Um, we have great fund safety. We okay. have one, one of the few okay. brokers in the world that started with uh, third-party fund administration, where we have a third party that actually governs deposits and withdrawals of funds. He's famous. Hi, my name is Peg Reed. I'm with Global Forex <laughs> Trading, GFT, located out of Grand Rapids, Michigan, although we have offices throughout the world. And he, I am the uh, Senior Vice President out. of uh, Business Development and uh, am responsible for deploying and executing products uh, that include FX, CFDs, binary options throughout the world to the end client, which is the retail client. Hi, CJ Daniel with FXCM. Obviously, we're based out of New York, but I'm currently based out of Hong Kong, been out here about five years. FXM has been in Hong Kong actually 10 years, April is going to be our 10 year anniversary. So our business uh, in greater China as well as Southeast Asia is significant, so we're happy to participate right in our backyard. My name is Michael Levin, I'm representing Exynos. Uh, we are one of the top 10 uh, retail brokers, less of course than FXM, but still we're doing about five yards per day and have a client base about 100,000 clients and live clients. Uh, before we begin, I want to take a moment to uh, congratulate Siju. I believe uh, you were just recently married the other day? Saturday. Uh, and uh, do you mind describing uh, how come you're here and not your honeymoon? <laughs> it was such a great event, I couldn't pass it by. <laughs> nice. So, um, so we're going to start. How do average account sizes and trading styles vary across China, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Sing Singapore, Vietnam, and Cambodia? And anything that uh, you guys have to say about um, nuances between the markets, this would be the, t the time to share. Well, yeah, sure. Um, you know, from uh, Indonesia, you know, Valbury's position is self to work with high network individuals. And, I'm not sure you're really familiar with it or not, but with uh, 120 million people in the middle class, it's uh, representing an incredible marketplace and, and just uh, businesses booming through, throughout. And so account sizes typically start off at 100,000 US dollars, uh, but then we also do have a couple other subsidiaries in the retail space that uh, have smaller account sizes. I think we're probably one of the more, because uh, we're regulated in, uh, in Indonesia, we're one of the more conservative uh, brokers there. And uh, so the, uh, the, the, I would say for the uh, account sizes for kind of the more retail general population or you know, anywhere between 1000 and, and $3,000 would, I mean, it might surprise you being, being um, you know, larger sizes. It actually did surprise me, but uh, also see, uh, you know, a bit of those trends in, in Southeast Asia and Malaysia, for example. Um, uh, so, yeah, there's, don't do so much business Cambodia or, or, or Vietnam, really. And uh, just specifically between Indonesia and Malaysia, can you say a little bit about the differences between those two markets? Well, in, from, a, from, a, from the, the um, perspective of the deposit sizes, I'm, I'm uh, seeing many more affluent uh, Malaysians with bigger deposit sizes. They'll start off with you know five, ten thousand dollars, and then then then, then uh, you know send over a hundred grand. Uh, Mario. Well, we deal more uh, on the retail side, not so much on the high net worth. Over in Asia, I'm based in, out of Singapore, so I travel fairly frequently over Southeast Asia. I, I've seen, uh, seen the 
on the ground with the retail guys in Singapore, Malaysia, um, Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam, what we do realize is that when we compete uh, in the retail space, the, for account size, Mitch, uh, probably one of the lower accounts in, in, in our perspective would be in Jakarta, Indonesia, people are opening accounts anywhere from 100 bucks to 500 bucks. In Singapore, in the region at least, I find that uh, um, the Singaporeans are a bit more financially savvy. So uh, there's a huge group of people who all the while they've been interested in stocks, they're now moving towards CFDs. And it's, it's great news for all of us who, who are there in the Forex space simply because um, those who are financially savvy, the only reason why they're moving into CFDs is simply because they can short, there's a, li a little bit more leverage. But if you come to think about it, it's only a matter of time before this group then migrates to the Forex space because we can long and short at any time. And we have leverage a whole lot higher than the CFD markets. So in Singapore, um, our clients uh, fund anywhere between three thousand to ten thousand uh, dollars U.S. dollars as an average. And in Thailand, Vietnam, where we're just starting to get a little bit of traction, we see anywhere between five hundred bucks to two thousand. So in that space, um, at least where we compete, the the retail boys, uh, sorry, the retail people in in, in Indonesia uh, have the smaller accounts for us. And then Thailand, Vietnam, then moving to uh, Singapore and a little bit of China. Because you're offering them 10,000 to one leverage? No, 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 man, bro. We, we, don't, we don't do that. Uh, I'm an educator. Don't forget that, right? So, so we, we don't give 10,000 to one leverage. It's impossible. Um, but we do give something slightly higher, for sure. Um, 100, 200. We, we are regulated in the FSC, so we can give leverage up to 500 to one. Did you find that the clients in Asia are, are very uh, concerned with uh, counterparty risk, uh, safety of funds? Absolutely. So there's, there's about three things that, that the, the average retail trader in, in Asia looks for. Number one, competitive pricing. Everyone wants, I mean, gone are the days where you can quote euro dollar with a 10 pip spread. You know, no one buys that anymore. Okay, so people are always looking for the best pricing. That's point number one. Point number two, they look for fund safety. So they're going to always ask, you know, well, what are you guys doing about my funds? They're not so interested in this word called segregated accounts anymore. You know, it's kind of a pass sale. Almost every broker provides segregated accounts. They want something more. How are you governing my process? What is the process of my funds? Um, I got a classic case, right? Because I'm based in Singapore, and when MF Global went down, it's, it's, it's all uh, public news now. And everyone was asking, um, you know, Singapore is considered one of the world's, uh, well, I would say foremost financial centers. It's in fact, number four in the world, right after UK, New York, and Tokyo. And why is it that in such a regulated environment, MF Global could go down? You know, whether it's a counterparty risk that you talk about. So it's not so much about regulation anymore. I'm not saying regulation is not important. The, the greatest question, the retail guys, some of you who are sitting in the crowd, and because I've met with thousands of them on all my trips, all of them are asking, show me a way that my money is safe. I just got to know so, whether so, my money is safe. So it's safe, safe to say that uh, safety of funds is very important. Almost paramount importance, bro. Right. Uh, Peck? Yeah, I would say safety of funds as well is the, obviously is very important along with transparency. You know, they fr frequently are asking that, you know, how can they see, how can they manage their funds and make sure that they are, in fact, you know, available to them. Although I guess the word segregated funds has constantly been um, overdone, I think it is important and there is a sense of comfort when, a, when an individual um, understands that their funds are segregated and, you know, can't be used as working capital. So I think that that is, you know, something over that continues to be uh, very important to the market segment. Additionally, as it goes to the contract size that you were talking about earlier, I think that has to do with the maturity of the markets and where they are. If you look at a Cambodia, Vietnam, as we know, the maturity of that market in this space is not as uh, is not as involved. Um, if you look at Indonesia, Malaysia, yes, frequently we we definitely see a higher a higher level. Um, I look at distribution streams, and I look at you know between the banks and the brokers, and as we look at those, and whether it's the actual end retail client or a market segment that has high net worth individuals, you know, I find that um, what we want to do is make sure that we're in a distribution stream where there is a level of education that's understood by the actual um, end investor so that they have you know, a better than average chance in order to be successful in these markets. Now, Peg, uh, you mentioned, a, I think, a, a key, I call it buzzword, that I hear a lot myself as well, and that's uh, segregated funds. If you just started a broker, you're, you're running your own retail brokerage, and you're looking to hedge, basically hedge your risk, or if you're just an individual looking for a place to trade, and a broker says they, they segregate funds, how would you define segregation of funds? 
Well, segregation of funds, from my perspective, is funds that can't be used for anything. It's safety, it's there, it can't be touched, it can't be used for the working capital within the firm. Uh, would it be um, acceptable in a segregated, with segregated funds to rehypothecate some of those funds uh, for the purpose of covering risk? Uh, potentially. I, yeah, potentially. Did you? I would echo the same thing about safety of funds. We find that probably since 2008, it's become even more prevalent. Uh, and Peg touched upon transparency. And for us at FXCM, since our listing, our financials are completely transparent. So we direct a lot of our customers to our financials, our quarterly releases, our balance sheet as a sign of our strength. So we find that that has become critically important. As to the question of you know the differences between account sizes, things like that, the trading style, I think, goes hand in hand with the size of the account. What I tend to find is that Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, and Indonesia, to a certain extent, are our high net worth customers. Right? And with high net worth customers, their trading style tends to be a little bit less active. Uh, in a place like Hong Kong, because of the leverage and margin, again, there's 5% margin, 20 to 1 leverage, uh, they're restricted to a certain, account, to a certain extent. Uh, for the rest of China, Vietnam, Cambodia, we t tend to find smaller account sizes. And what we're finding is that as these countries are maturing, you're finding that traders are moving just from being a manual trader to more EA-based traders and things like that. So execution for them also becomes critically important. So on the higher end with the high net worth customers, I would say safety of funds. And then on the lower end in terms of execution, handling EAs and things like that. And, and do you find that the, um, the you know, basically the, the traders with smaller account sizes or the traders with bigger account sizes, uh, which one has more of a tendency to use social platforms? The smaller account sizes, smaller guys. And I don't know, I've noticed, I'm curious if you notice the same, they all tend to follow the exact same strategy. They do, I think they, they like the sense of community. I mean, trading is a individual pursuit, right? So I think, particularly for our smaller traders, they like to be part of a bigger community, see what other people are doing. And I think some of the products, you know, and some of the, uh, the companies that are exhibiting today, I think they've done very well because of this social trading aspect, following leaders and things like that. So I think it's gonna be something that's gonna be important as we go forward. And Michael? I don't know what to add, but I just, maybe uh, my point of view is that all of these countries, they like aggressive trading. You won't find a lot of clients who just like some positional trading. It's, uh, maybe it's because of their account size and also because in Europe, but still maybe as that uh, we offer high leverage and tight spreads, that's why they like scalping and so on. Uh, but still, I want to say that uh, in China, we, are, we see that uh, the amount and the account sizes are growing constantly for, for the last five years. So out of the five yards a day that you mentioned uh, you know, Exynos does, about what percentage comes from Southeast Asia? Uh, I can't tell you exactly. Uh, as for all of these countries, uh, which were in the list, uh, we got uh, one yard per, more than one yard per month. About, a, uh, not half, but, but one fourth of all of our volumes uh, come from China. Do you, do you find it to be growing more than in other regions? Yes, yes. And do, do more of the volumes come from the higher leverage accounts or from the, the lower leverage with bigger balances? Uh, in our system, uh, the leverage uh, decreases when your equity grows. So probably I can say that uh, the most of our volumes came from accounts with uh, 5,000 uh, United States dollars and with uh, leverage in one to uh, 500, if I'm mistaken. Something like that. Uh, for the next question, uh, we'll start with Michael this time. Uh, and that's, um, what are the differences between marketing to uh, Muslim versus non-Muslim countries in Southeast Asia? Okay, the main point of view here is whether you respect or not uh, the uh, attitude to the interest uh, rates. And so, uh, do you offer swap-free accounts or not? Uh, in our company, we decided that uh, for the Southeast Asia, which are Islamic countries such as uh, Indonesia and Malaysia, uh, all of clients who came from there, they got swap-free accounts automatically, and they can't trade with swaps at all for some risk management. And you know, there's some kind of swap cheating techniques and that's why they can't get swap at all. And then how do you prevent um, you know, someone taking advantage of that? Um, 
first, you know, when we started, uh, we don't have so free accounts at all, and after we introduce them, then we see a growth. This is it. And you, you don't really look and monitor to see if someone's going, you know, long, like short euros are, <laughs> just holding it or going long with you and just holding it for a long time, going to another broker, going the opposite way and arbitraging that way? We are monitoring it and uh, I can say that uh, traders stay with us for about, you know, the average uh, period of trading with us for one trader is two years. So probably uh, there are clients who trade with us for a week and then left us and there are clients who trade with us for five years and this is it. So. We do monitor in our system, of course. Did you? We don't differentiate actually between marketing you know, to Muslim versus non-Muslims. We find that this, we focus on the same exact topics regardless of whatever the faith may be. So safety of funds, size, uh, services, support, and particularly within Southeast Asia, I think in language support. Uh, these are the things that we focus on. So obviously if a customer is uh, Muslim and he requires a Sharia compliant account, we have that available and we obviously let them know clearly that it's available, but the main touch points are still the same whether they're Muslim or non-Muslim. Yeah, I would say we, uh, I would uh, agree, we obviously don't compromise one's beliefs. So as a result, you know, whatever the law is that is prevalent in that particular culture, that is absolutely what we're going to address. Um, it needs as far as what we offer has to be across the board consistent. Um, if there is something significant or something specific in that environment, we certainly do our best in order to accommodate that. Uh, and that's where we go into each market. We look at what's re essential, what's required, what actually works in terms of deployment, in terms of getting uh, traders actually trading versus not, and seeing what uh, obviously what our competitors are doing that has made them successful. And if we are the first in that market, then we obviously are looking at exactly what it's going to take in order to make sure that be it the product, be it the language skills, be it the educational components are all there in order to ensure the fact that the end retail client has the best success they can to be profitable. And then. Um I know you, you have a lot of experience in both, both the retail and the institutional side of the business. Um, do you have any advice or maybe you can mention some of the different w ways out there to deal with the interest-free accounts and to ensure that as a broker uh, you don't you know, lose money on it or are the victim of, of arbitrage? No, I mean, I think what we do is from a compliance point of view, I hate to use the word, but from a compliance point of view, we, you know, we ensure the fact that we have forms that are filled out that assure the fact that there is not going to be any kind of arbitrage um, situation that might present itself. So, um, you know, we have to, we, we again, um, set up the accounts so that they are uh, compliant with what needs to be done, and then we, um, we don't over-monitor them, but uh, trust the fact that uh, they are being engaged with as they're supposed to. Mario. Well, I, I most agree with, with Siju in a sense that we don't segregate in terms of um, how we market differently to Muslims or non-Muslims. I think everyone in, in the retail space or whether you're in the high net worth space, the, the things are the same. We're all the same in a sense that why would you even step into a market like that? The key thing is, number one, you would like to make a decent profit. Where we are now in, in the world, everyone is looking for an alternative asset class, right? Especially in Asia, prices are high. Property is high. Um, equity markets are a little bit stunted. You don't really have a lot of yield, is what I'm using. So where the, the Forex space in general offers such an exciting opportunity, it is still a space whereby it, it presents itself as an alternative asset class, very stable one, in my view at least. So for Muslims, yes, one of the key priorities in that offerings would be Sharia compliant accounts. Do you, do you have swap free? Because they don't really, really believe in money as a store of value. They believe in money as a medium of exchange. And that simply means that money uh, has got to be created. Value must be created in the market. So that's probably number one they look for. Having said that, all else remains the same. Everyone wants to see, how are my funds safe? Are you a regulated broker? What exactly are your educational offerings? Just, just one uh, small point. I was having a little bit of banter with, with Jim. You know, when we, when we talk about uh, leverage, you know, would you give 10,000 is to one leverage, 100 is to one leverage. But the retail guy on the ground, at least, here's something for me as an educator. You need leverage. Let me just say this. If you are in a position of wanting to scale your cash, you need leverage. I wrote an article that really opened the eyes of the retail forex world called Get Leverage. All right? You need leverage in a sense that if you want to earn decent yield, 10% a year, 20% per year, 30% a year, you need leverage. You need something that can scale up your cash. 
But how then would you be in a position to take care of your, your losses, so to speak, have a proper trading strategy, always put a stop loss? So the key point here for retail traders in the crowd, you need leverage. Yep. Don't take this personally if you are Muslim, but the further away uh, from Mecca I get, the, least import, the lesser important it, it, it seems to be, uh, we don't even offer Sharia compliant uh, accounts in, uh, in Indonesia and the population is about 70 percent, 60 percent Muslim there. I, it is, it, it's, it's not so important. I, don't, I see it also in, in, in Malaysia. Um, the, the, the banks I've worked with in Malaysia, when they're going to the Bank Negara and, and doing presentations there, they, don't, they, they say, leave the Sharia laws aside. Let's just talk about, uh, about Forex. But you know, there's one thing is, is that I think that uh, for the most part, the, you know, the, you know, with the oncoming of FX trading on, from a retail perspective, a lot of the uh, consumer population has been pretty much wiped out by the bucket shops. I mean, Indonesia has one of the hugest uh, trading volumes, I would say, just behind uh, Jap Japan from my calculations. Uh, but you wouldn't know that because so much of that is driven underground. Now, when, you know, when that happens and, and when we're going back to reactivate clients, they just say, we don't trade anymore. But I was with the president of the Indonesian Stock Exchange. Now, of course, this is going to stocks and equities, and it's not uh, FX, but we don't have much information to go on in FX because it's not so transparent, particularly between the providers. But in the Indonesian Stock Exchange, they, they are. There are uh, about 460 stocks on the uh, Indonesian Stock Exchange. 180 of them are Sharia compliant. 13 of them are approved by the National Council of Moms. And that is kind of where they're going to gain more market share. So I don't know, maybe it is a place where you can start from to actually reactivate uh, client base is from Sharia compliant accounts. Are you saying uh, you can be successful in Muslim countries without uh, the interest-free accounts? Yeah, absolutely, because you know, for the most part, Great. these are punters. Yeah, they, they, they want to go after the, the big returns, like uh, Mario said. Um, so for the next question, start with um, Siju. Uh, how, do you, is, how, do you, uh, view, how does your firm view the legality of FX trading in China? And what are either your experience with strategies to break into the market or uh, just general strategies you've seen available? China obviously represents a large portion of FXCM's overall business. Uh, we strategically, 10 years ago, decided to set up shop in Hong Kong for that reason. Hong Kong, although not, oh, Hong Kong, although it's SAR uh, of China, um, it's a bit different than that. Our product, Margin FX, is fully regulated, so we can come in with a license, set up shop. The rules and regs are the same. The laws are the same. So we felt that Hong Kong was a great gateway into China, and that's why you know we made that decision years ago. Now, as to the legality of, of trading, I mean, as long as we look at it from an onshore, offshore perspective, you know, I think. In terms of sending capital outside of China, I believe the government at the, at the present moment allows 50,000 US dollars per year to flow outside. What customers tend to do with that funds as they go outside is, is irrelevant. If they want to use it for FX trading or investments or whatever it may be, that's perfectly fine. So we're very careful in how we operate in China that you know, we operate out of Hong Kong, we're regulated by the SFC. Uh, we obviously have customers coming from China, but they open either with our Hong Kong entity or even our London entity. But inside of China, we're very, uh, you know, we're very conservative in how we do business. You know, we do not take any deposits onshore. You know, we do not open any accounts onshore. Uh, so I think, from our perspective, you know, we've played it fairly conservative, uh, but we focused on education, having in-language Chinese support. We've got over 100 people in Hong Kong dedicated just to our Chinese business. And while, you know, it might have been, I know other firms and competitors have been more aggressive, we feel that our long-term play uh, has really benefited us well. And I think even to our Chinese customers, they look at Hong Kong as a stronghold. They're comfortable with, with Hong Kong. They're comfortable with the safety of their funds. Uh, so we feel that's a strategy that's worked out very well for us. Are you saying like uh, someone living in China uh, that wants to open a Forex trading, trading account with an FS, SFC regulated broker can just send the money, open an account with a firm like FXCM, send you the money directly, and that's perfectly acceptable. That's perfectly acceptable, yes. Interesting. Um, yeah, well, as long as 
um, things are done outside of China, yes, that is perfectly acceptable. Um, they say that, you know, you can do an educational component in China. My concern about China and any one of these markets is that, um, that the level of education that is being shared uh, within that country and the people that are then engaging in this product, uh, I'm hoping that over time we see that even enhance itself. I was spent 28 years in the institutional world doing FX. I was a trader and I've been on the retail side for about the last nine to 10 years. And what I continually see is, you know, I don't want to see the market go the way as say Korea, for instance, which now is at 10% leverage and, you know, prior to uh, last year was at a much higher level. And that is usually a function of the fact that you get um, significant complaints that come from that individual uh, within the community because they're either losing money, not making money, money, uh, situations along that nature um, in those markets. China is on everybody's radar. It's, you know, it's what everybody's doing, it's where everybody's at. Um, I do think people need to be focusing then on what's the next market, uh, which I do think there are markets that are out there that are going to be equally as, um, as valuable as, as that. But as we look at that market, I think it's critical that we do everything we can to help that individual client make money. And that's what's concerning me right now. We're not doing that. What's concerning me is that everybody is sitting there looking at this as just one big gold mine. And who ends up suffering? The individual. And then our industry will suffer after that. Absolutely. Because then you bring in the regulators. Ariel, let, let, let me say this. Everyone sees China as a gold mine. You know, second largest economy in the world, $5 trillion GDP annual turnover. But what really is stopping all of us as brokers or even uh, you know, for, for Forex as a whole? I see this as a gathering of friends whereby it, it really is a collaboration of how do we move into China. Yet China is the big pie. Well, I see it as two things. Number one, the regulators themselves, which is in fact a good thing, they're all warming up to the fact of this asset class called Forex. Recently, I was invited into China to spend time with the managing director of Shenzhen Economic Daily. All right, so he, he, he's in charge of this uh, uh, business newspaper. And as we speak, as we get to know one another, as he understands a little bit of more of what I stand for, and I stand for Forex trading all, all these years, I want everyone to understand that the market is opening up in terms of the internalization of the renminbi. That's great news. Huh? Hong Kong is the first site that allows offshore trading. Singapore is now number two. Having said that, with the new administration in China, I can, you can well imagine over the next few years, the entire country is going to be opening up. So this is great news for everybody. Now, in terms of where we as brokers or we as educators or game players in the industry come in, yes, the, the absolute consensus over here is education. China needs to be educated. They have money. We all know that, right? But they need to understand also Education has got to play a big part. So it really is an appeal to, to all of us sitting here. I mean, if you are wearing the educational hat, whether you're running an academy or running a brokerage firm, let's all stand together and provide world-class education to this one country. There are just too many scams running around in China anymore. And as Jim correctly says, if those scams are allowed to have their way, sooner or later, our industry suffers. So let's really all stand together. In terms of education, we still view it as, or rather the regulators view it as something illegal. In my view, it's going to be opening up, but let's come together in terms of providing world-class education to China. Uh, just a, a follow-up question. Uh, you brought something up in terms of you know, scams going on you know, in China. Uh, I'm very familiar that there's been hackers, um, things like that, people copying websites. Uh, you may see something posted in Forex, Forex Magnate soon. Uh, about one of those, uh, but how do you deal with um, a hacker situation or uh, someone posting a website? Do you, do, what would you do if someone you know, copied FX Prime's site in, in China or started hacking you? Well, I, I, my answer is get with the program, man. I mean, in a sense, after today, I, I think this is stream, right? I think in a while, in 10 minutes, it's going to be in China already. Anyway, people are always on the copying front. I think in a sense, what we can really do to protect ourselves is to really safeguard IPs. I think that's one. Intellectual property is absolutely important. People will find fraud over there. I know companies who are making intellectual property a business. We need to say if China does sue, uh, sorry, if China does copy, you then go on full force you know, by, by suing them and making money out of that. But realistically speaking, I'm saying it's very difficult for, for, for you to copy unless you want to remain closed up. If you want to explore blue ocean strategies, I want to conquer the world, I want to take dominion, it's really difficult to stop hackers and all that from coming in. Right? But what you can do is, again, putting up softwares, putting up uh, uh, 
fences, so to speak, to ring fence your intellectual property. Okay, and then, um, so like, I guess another question is for procedural is like, hypothetically speaking, say someone is um, going after a uh, platform and doing a DDoS attack, uh, shutting down the service, calling the firm saying like, send me 50 grand and I'll stop. Um, I don't know if any of you have had that experience, but like, what, would, what do you do in that situation? Do you pay them the $50,000? Uh, do you use some other mechanism to, to handle that? But assuming that you're in a situation where the system is shut down, they're contacting you, telling you to wire money somewhere, what are your options? Well, you just, I guess Jim, you get prepared and you uh, prevent, prevent that from happening in the first place. I believe there's a service, I think, with VeriSign, is that right? Well, oh. there's the preparing, yeah. right? And then there's the what if it happens right now. Uh, just, you have to just kind of look at what you're ready to lose. Is it, just, I, it, it affects your business wholeheartedly, yeah. I think that's a business decision, right? Yeah. <laughs> depending on how long it's going to take because depending on where you're working and what, what authority you're just dealing with, um, again, I think it ultimately comes down to a business decision, but you know, pretty much what Jim said, you want to make sure that the platform you're operating with is as stable, as secure as possible, encryption levels are high. At FXM, we have over 150 people in technology, many people dedicated just to security and, and safety issues, so I do think it's important. And to go to the other point about counterfeit websites, things like that, uh, Mario started, or you, I think you posed that question, we've had that actually <laughs> occur commonly. Uh, and you have trademark and copyright infringements, and it's funny because I can easily get my legal and compliance involved, and they're happy to send a cease and desist, but I'm pretty sure it's just going to get deleted. <laughs> it has virtually no impact. So one of the benefits, particularly in Hong Kong that we had, was we had an individual who copied our website and had um, deposit instructions. And I recall that it was actually, we, we banked with HSBC in Hong Kong, and uh, the, the counterfeit website actually had an HSBC bank account as well. So we were tipped off by one of our clients. And being in Hong Kong, I mentioned earlier, the, the regulatory structure, the legal structure, we were able to contact the, the Hong Kong police. And the Hong Kong police were involved. They contacted HSBC right away. The bank account was shut down. The cybersecurity team was getting involved, and so on and so forth. Now, if that happened in China, in mainland China, I don't know exactly what kind of cooperation I would be getting. So I, could, I feel very comfortable operating in Hong Kong uh, in that structure, knowing that the authorities are there, they're very capable, and they're very quick and willing to help. Okay. And um, I, I think it's just important to say that this is not something uh, unique to the foreign exchange market. I believe in the past year, the uh, U.S. State Department site has been taken down, Bank of America. I think anyone is, some, is vulnerable to some extent. Uh, and it, I don't know, it seems to me, maybe it seems that way to you, that this is a, kind of like an arms race terms of uh, technology. Th does anyone else have anything to add uh, in dealing with hack hackers? Uh, we have faced several times about DDoS, DDoS attacks uh, and uh, not just we were involved and some other forex companies were down too and uh, we just realized that we have to spend a lot of money on to prevent this and we actually done this and uh, currently as far as I know as from, from our IT guys uh, it's about to be impossible to DDoS our website and our servers because of not just software but also uh, there are a lot of servers which uh, you know uh, tracking IPs and so on in addition to our trading servers and many others. Yeah, I think it's a constant quality in the surveillance of your own technology. You have to continue to look at that. You have to continue to ensure the fact that you're keeping an eye on exactly how it's being accessed, who's accessing it, looking at the different markets you're going into. Again, that's one of these type of situations from my perspective that, you know, one size does not fit all. And so depending upon the different markets you're on, you're going to um, have certain nuances to that. And uh, from a technology standpoint, you have to maintain, um, you know, a quality-driven product that is constantly being uh, looked at and, um, and, and ensuring the fact that you have the elements in place to prevent any kind of attack as far as possible. We, to this point, have been very lucky. And Jim, do you have anything to add regarding the uh, legality of FX trading in China? I'm uh, going to visit the Beijing office after this, so I have to say that I just hold the party line. Yeah, <laughs> okay. 
I just, on the legality component of that, I just want to, I think we're still fairly far away from that being something that is uh, going to be made legal inside China. Um, in fact, in the event, you know, we, we continue to know that the stock market is something there that the authorities want to ensure the fact continues to get as much momentum as it possibly can. You know, and obviously if you are to legalize something like FX, um, that's going to detract from that. Uh, additionally, you know, the question becomes in the event they do legalize it, who actually is going to have the opportunity to partake in that? Would that be the large banks in China that then would start to deploy a retail FX, or would that be the brokers? What's going to happen to that market? Um, the next question um, is uh, which countries in Asia uh, do you feel it's necessary to have local staff um, and why? And in addition to that, if you could elaborate on uh, the value or um, uniqueness or importance of introducing brokers in Asia and maybe mention whether uh, they're more important in some countries versus others. You know, my experience is, is that I think you see a bit of a trend that has gone towards uh, more of a local presence, local banking, uh, more closer interaction with the, with, with, with the clients. Uh, this could be kind of, you know, an aftermath of uh, a number of um, scams, you know, where, where I've seen in, in uh, Malaysia where, where people have lost uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And uh, so when I meet with them, they, 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 they talk about the FSA regulation and, you know, the safety of client funds and where are the funds going. And often there are through uh, introduced relationships, right? So with, within, within a number of countries, in Indonesia, Malaysia, I see there are you know, multi-level marketing uh, organizations uh, and having that uh, local, the local marketing staff on the ground, not only uh, the, the, the banking and the, and the other support is becoming more and more important to grow the market space. I find for, we operate mostly in, in Asia, uh, in terms of local staff, other than Singapore, I mean, Singapore, you, you can get by with English, and all, it's, it's fairly fine, but in, in most other places, whether it's in Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia, um, yeah, we, the local staff is absolutely important for a couple of reasons, right? Number one, it does help us understand in terms of the local culture. I think that's just one of the easiest things. As a foreigner, if I step into a country, yes, we want to gain market share, but we may not really understand what it takes to set up shop over there. So having a local staff to actually guide you in terms of local culture, that's point number one. To help you understand uh, in terms of the, the regulatory framework in the country, absolutely important. You know, rules in, in Singapore, which is governed by the MAS, might be different in Indonesia, that's governed by the BAPEPTI. So absolutely important. Uh, local language in Thailand, Vietnam, we find um, having a local person that actually picks up the call does tremendous help. So. Um, in the space that, that we run in for Asia, having a local staff, paramount importance in terms of local culture, in terms of language, in terms of the regulation framework. Yeah, I find that in the area that we're in, which is, or area that I primarily cover, which is global distribution, I find that doing deals and empowering the local entity in a, in a various country is where um, we get our, our greatest um, level of business from. So I think it's critically important that we deal with an entity that has a strong footprint in that country, that has the local services, that has both technology and um, the educational components that I mentioned earlier, as well as having the local support at that level. Um, because only that local support is going to understand, I think, the real needs of that individual retail client that is then being serviced by that uh, bank, brokerage house that I'm engaging in? I think if, if the market is important enough, you must have local staff. So for, for FXCM, our focus was greater China. So primarily in Asia, our, our primary language was either Chinese, simplified, or traditional, depending on where we were targeting. Everything else was English. So Southeast Asia as a whole was pretty much primarily conducted in English. And it was just a few years ago that we realized that the potential in Southeast Asia was substantial. And English a blanket coverage just wasn't going to work. So we needed to go out, fire, uh, sorry, find uh, native speakers, build, not fire, find, <laughs> find native speakers, and not only native speakers, because I remember interviewing individuals who are, for example, Vietnam, uh, Vietnamese Americans, 
Just because you happen to speak the language isn't enough. You need someone who actually grew up there, someone who preferably had a professional career there as well, so they know the nuances and ins and outs of that country. Just like the others said, there's a lot of little quirks uh, within each country. So I think it's critical that you have native speakers who know the country on the ground. Uh, and for us, we've also built out uh, in-language websites. Now, depending on the country that you're operating in, like a country like Thailand, I believe it's critical that you have it in Thai. But if you're operating in the Philippines, they're very comfortable speaking in English. So it depends where you're trying to operate. Now, as to IBs, I mean, IBs for us are critically important. They represent nearly 50%, if not more, of our business. So particularly in areas 47 where- 47% in the last quarterly report. Sorry? I think it was 47% in the last- 47, <laughs> 50, let's, right around there. So I see a lot of IBs here today. So very, very important. Uh, so again, they represent a huge percentage of our business, and I think they're the ones that get us up to speed quickly on the market. So when we get into a country and we're trying to open it up, we're trying to find a few key partners, uh, almost like cornerstone partners that we can build a relationship with and take it from there. Because we may not know, just because uh, Peg mentioned it earlier, it's not a blanket strategy. It's just not a cookie cutter strategy. So what may work in you know, Malaysia may not work in Indonesia, so on and so forth. So I think our IBs give us a lot of intelligence, a lot of insight in terms of how we operate and we grow together. Uh, we have a little bit different experience with IBs because uh, we don't have one half of our volumes came from IBs, but about 80%. <laughs> and mainly it's from Southeast Asia. And uh, speaking about um, fine local stuff, uh, for us it was easier to find them in Malaysia and speaking uh, all languages of Southern, Southeast Asia. As for uh, for example, as for speaking about China, uh, I was the first I mean, uh, from supporting team who speaks Chinese, and after that, probably uh, the biggest uh, part of um, uh, about all of our support staff speaking Chinese currently in, in Russia. Um, you guys in Russia speaking Chinese? Huh? Sorry? You guys in Russia? Yes. Who know about the foreign exchange market and speak Chinese? Yes, yes. Uh, you can, you can uh, ask... A very uh, uh, unique skill set I'm sure a lot of the firms would be uh, interested in. You, you can ask Mario, for example, he, uh, he saw us on, in Guangzhou uh, exhibition about uh, half a year ago and uh, only our um, booth uh, was uh, um, European. All of our... Uh, you know, uh, Persons were Russians, and uh, everyone else they have uh, some. They employed some Chinese guys to help them to communicate with the clients on the exhibition. And for us, it's not it's not a problem to come from our office to China and to speak with our clients. Bro, you, you mean Mitch was saying the, the the Russian people they were speaking Chinese? Yeah. Wow. Did you, did you mention that you speak Chinese? Yes, uh, but today I'm losing my experience. I, I can't still. <laughs> it's quite impressive. Like I don't think it's an easy language to learn. Uh, it's not an easy, of course. But uh, I was studying in uh, Shenyang uh, Polytechnic University for some time, uh, learning the Chinese and also studies in Russia. It, uh, but it's hard Did you like uh, guys during lunch, during your lunch break at work? I'll have a Rosetta Stone session on the Chinese <laughs> Chinese training class. Uh, no, <laughs> I don't remember this. No, in the Soviet right. area, there's a huge amount of Chinese-Soviet uh, uh, interaction and exchange programs. So you, and, and students, you have enormous numbers of people in Russia that have been to China uh, over the years and speak Chinese. Yeah, very yeah. impressive. Um, yeah, I continue to think, though, that the, the bottom line is you're, the individual that we're attempting to assist here is that retail consumer customer who needs that language in their spoken language that needs the tools in their spoken that are going to assist them that is going to do whatever it can in order to help them make money and so it's not about me taking my product and fitting it in there and not tweaking it as it relates to ensuring the fact that they have all the tools necessary in order to uh, you know potentially win at this game which is you know to make money it's about making sure that on the ground there's everything there that they absolutely have so they have a better than even chance in order to accomplish what they're looking to accomplish start with uh, I guess peg on this question it's a really a follow-up to the last question uh, and it is um, what are some of the different uh, strategies that you have seen uh, introducing brokers use to add value and be successful 
uh, across the world and maybe some of the, 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 the strategies that they use specifically in Asia? I mean, I think in Asia, one of the specific strategies we continue to see is, you know, be it webinars, be it the educational seminars, be it technical analysis, um, you know, really showing the discipline of trading. The differences, the big differences between the institutional world and the retail world is that word discipline in terms of how that individual actually sets a trade, puts a take profit, a stop loss in and use it, utilizes this as a financial instrument versus a gambling tool, quite frankly. And so from that perspective, if you can continually to reinforce that, um, and particularly in markets where individuals have an appetite for risk, which I think they do in Asia, um, then I think you, ha you are providing another area where it's going to give them uh, a chance in order to make this a very favorable investment. It, it, sound, it sounds to me that uh, I guess education is, is always a very important uh, tool. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, a big, I'm big in the educational world on the retail side. Yeah, I see education is playing a bigger and bigger role uh, and I've seen lately more, uh, uh, let's say, uh, trading groups be formed, just people that have kind of share the knowledge and experience of trading and also, uh, the, uh, I think a new trend is FX uh, managed funds. And so people with either the real deep professional background and knowledge are uh, leading these, uh, the, the, these trade followers. Do you find that to be uh, quite successful in, in Indonesia specifically? I see that happening uh, first in, uh, um, in Australia, in uh, Malaysia. I think it's uh, more time that will we'll come you know, as I see it roll out in, uh, in, in Southeast Asia. But it's interesting because what will, what will happen is people who have kind of have general interest in, in trading FX that don't do it full time, yet have a few, you know, tens of thousands or 100,000 in, in, in the market, you know, they like to pit their group against the, the professional guy trading a, a managed fund and they'll, you know, have their get togethers on a regular basis. So it's another form of social uh, trading that's actually interacting, yeah. Very interesting. So at this time, we're going to move on to some questions from the audience. And uh, I'd be curious if there's any introducing brokers in the, in the audience, if they could uh, you know, maybe first comment on something, a way that they find it, uh, they are successful uh, by, uh, in being an introducing broker. Jason? Any IBs? Want to Okay, so uh, anyone else that has any question for the audience? At a lively Richard, crowd. If you don't mind, uh, just on the question that you had about uh, the value added, I think education obviously is, is, is the most obvious. Um, and in terms of being more and more online, we've, we've, we have IBs who are tremendously successful that are one-man operations. You know, they're doing webinars, they have QQ groups with you know, over a thousand people following them, and they're doing tremendously well. So that's the sort of online social aspect of it that's doing really, really well. And then there's an interesting aspect of, of an offline IB sort of model that, that seems to also work very well. So particularly in a place like China that's so big and so vast, we have some of our IBs that simply take our content, our material, and simply reintroduce it to customers. So for example, if you're in a remote city where you know, the customers don't know FXEM that well or whatever it may be, we have IBs who simply take our resources, so we have daily effects in Chinese, and they simply present it to them, or they take our platform walkthroughs and pr present it to them or something like that. So the value that these IBs add is that they're there locally. FXM is based in Hong Kong. The customer cannot come visit us in Hong Kong, but if it's in Dalian or Shenyang or wherever it may be, the IB simply is physically there. He's a point of contact for them, and I find that you know, that's a value added that I was surprised to find out about, but it's quite successful. So in other words, indirectly, the broker, you as the broker will add value to the IBs by providing them the resources to go out and be successful. Yeah, you can actually, they, they can take the material and they can rebrand it themselves. And so they don't have to reinvent the wheel and they have all that at their disposal in order to uh, download to their individual client, be it, be it online or in written form. Anything to add, Michael? Just want to add that uh, regardless education, which is expect uh, in China we saw that uh, the more IBs return to the client regarding the spreads and from some of their commissions uh, the better they are for the clients for example one of our top IBs he returns about 90 percent of his commission to, to the clients so, so he got about uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure 500 clients five five thousand clients so 
he basically pays back his rebate to yeah, the customer. It, yes, it's called rebate programs, and they are really popular and for Chinese guys. But how do you guys deal with paying IBs a specific amount? Uh, along with spread compression due to competition. I, I want to add to, to what Michael said. He's, he's, he's right in the sense that it's not a one-step blanket over everything. You know, every culture is different. As an example, in Singapore, people are very interested in, in education, very interested in fundamental analysis, or what is the reason this country is going down, what is the reason Spain's unemployment is 25% and all that. And in other countries, it's something else. See, So Singapore is very self-directed. They, they, they like education, they want to trade themselves. In countries like, like China specifically, um, they like more managed accounts. They have, you know, you can give them all the education, but it's it been my experience that they, they, don't really, they don't really like that. They said, okay, do you guys have managed account services? But, uh, you know, so every country is different. And again, in Thailand and Vietnam, which is why it, it, it struck me to mention that, they do a lot of this uh, rebate back. So as an IB, uh, big IBs, they are actually more um, free in, in giving those rebates back to the people, which I think is an excellent way for them to, get, to garner more traction and more clients. So really every country is different uh, in terms of what is the offerings. Education, yes, prime. Today, if you don't have world-class education, you can't even compete. But having said that, it needs to be localized in that specific country, which parts of the education does each specific country want. And Mario, where do you, sp and you're really an expert in the region as, as, far, as far as I know, and you do a lot of education uh, in the market. Uh, where would, if you were to make a bet on the next big emerging market within Southeast Asia or a specific country, where do you think there's going to be a lot of unexpected growth in the next five years? So we leave China out because China is not part of Southeast Asia in a sense. If it's in, I would say two areas specifically, Singapore, Indonesia, for various reasons. Just want to share a quick story, right? You know, if, but many people will, will come to me and say, Mario, but Singapore is too overcrowded. Really. Why would you want to still set up in, in Singapore? And the real answer is this, because the market is there. Today, let me ask you a question, friends. You know, if you have a chance to open up a restaurant, all right, would you open it up in, let's just say if it's a French restaurant, would you open it up in France when there's thousands of French restaurants? Or would you open it up in Greenland or Iceland where there isn't a French restaurant? And really, there, there's, there's two ways you can go about it, right? And most people would choose, oh, I would go into green pastures when there isn't a place. But it's untested ground. And one of the key answers which caused me to have a paradigm shift also, open it up, open your French restaurant in France, right next to the guy who has the most amount of clients over there. Have the best offerings, make it 10% cheaper, make your service 10% better, and then you get immediate base, all right, immediate traction to all those clients. So this is why I say I think Singapore is one of the great places uh, people are financially savvy, they have higher disposable income. Our GDP per capita recently by the IMF was at 58,000, which is one of the highest in the region. So I'll say Singapore. Singapore? Indonesia for emerging markets. Indonesia. Fourth largest population in the world. Well, then Peg, you look like you have something to add. <laughs> well, I think Singapore is a rather difficult market from a regulatory standpoint. I mean, I, you know, I all due respect, I think regulations are extremely important. But in terms of setting up uh, there and actually doing business inside Singapore, it can be a little bit difficult. And so I would look at one of the outlying areas, maybe Indonesia or Malaysia, as, uh, as an area of interest. Jim? I include India in Southeast Asia. I think the technology partners from India, I think the, the greater sense of transparency that's happening there, the uh, movement from uh, b-booking everything to sending trade straight through the market is being perceived as much more uh, altruistic way of trading and that uh, market will definitely uh, pop off when regulation comes into Michael? place. Michael? Uh, I just want to add some words about Vietnam. No, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, they are already developed and enough for, for me, and Singapore too. And uh, as we see currently, Vietnam is uh, boosted, and there are a lot of guys coming from Vietnam with big money. And they, I don't know why, but they like trading uh, gold. Yeah, the gold, gold is huge, yeah. In Indonesia, Vietnam, China, India, gold is, uh, gold is massive. I think if India is in the mix, that deserves its own panel, because I think India has the, the potential to be a, a game changer, just like China was. Obviously, we're dealing with a lot of regulatory restrictions with the RBI and things like that, but I think eventually it will open up in the currency flow. So I think it's going to get there. So India, in and of itself, can be potentially huge and, again, deserving of its own panel. In terms of emerging, emerging um, he did mention that maybe Indonesia has already emerged to a certain extent. There's many brokers there. There's 
I don't know, how, I don't know what the headcount is, but uh, but I do see tremendous opportunity in Indonesia because I think you know most recently uh, mini contracts were introduced in Indonesia. So prior to that, it was standard 100,000 contracts. So there was a limitation in terms of who your typical customer was. You know, average account sizes uh, was $10,000 or so, whatever it was. But now that mini contracts are going to be available. You know, your average account sizes can drop and you're opening it up to a much bigger uh, potential market with nearly 300 million people or more. I think that's going to be a huge market as well. Do you, does everyone on the panel find gold trading to be disproportionately popular in Asia? I would say yes, firstly, in countries like Thailand and Vietnam specifically. Where? Thailand and Vietnam. These countries love trading gold. In fact, the whole of Asia loves trading gold. There's an element of, of speculation within us. We like to take risks, but more so when it comes to gold, bullion, gold, silver, I would say Thailand, Vietnam. It's just, say it is traditionally uh, gold trading uh, countries, yeah. So they, they do focus on gold and everything else has, is relative to gold. Peg. Yeah, I wouldn't say disproportionately um, in many ways. I would, you know, you look at Latin America, that's also a, a market that does extensive amounts of gold. So, I mean, in Asia, I think, yes, you've got, you know, FX and gold in certain areas, gold a bit more. But um, across the globe, I find that uh, it's sort of following the lead of what we've been seeing in some of the other areas of the world. Did you? Gold's our second uh, most traded product. So Euro dollar number one, gold number two. So we introduced, you know, gold about two years ago and it wasn't surprising to see that Asia was you know the biggest taker of that product so I think for cultural reasons in certain parts particularly in China India obviously as well uh, but I think it's a product that they're very comfortable with and I remember having a conversation with a, with a client about this why why he liked to trade gold so much and his answer was it's just simple it's up or down you know where it's binary yeah, it's pretty much up or down when, it, when did gold become the number two if you, you know I think tail end of last year tail end of last year is when it and it, do you find it growing even more this the se I, I found it to grow even the second half of this year when everything else was kind of flattening out. Uh, certainly, I mean, it, it flattened out with the rest of everything as well, but especially now, the beginning of this year with January, we've seen good volatility in the marketplace, and we're seeing that obviously that instrument is just as popular. And I guess finally, it, um, Michael, do you have any comments about gold trading? Uh, as far as I know, speaking about volatility, uh, all institutional platforms. Uh, uh, which uh, offers gold trading, the leverage is uh, probably less than on the FX. So it's correct, the volatility is really high. I want to thank everyone, uh, uh, the panelists, the audience uh, for attending. I uh, hope you all had a good time. That will wrap it up. Thank you. Thank you too.